Hello and welcome to Carefree Blues Podcast, a podcast and supplement to my weekly column as part of the Soccer Yanks Podcast Network. I am Kyle. And I'm Amity. And we are your co-hosts of the Carefree Blues Podcast. And we are here today to bring you episode numero... Uh, I can't remember nine in Spanish, but... Um, nueve? No. Yes, that's it. Nueve, yeah. Numero nueve. Uh, I don't even know if numero is Spanish for number. Honestly, really, I don't know either, but we'll go with it. Yeah, really piss poor research by me, as always. Nonetheless. Shoot sure at your Spanish research, man. Come on. Exactly. I haven't taken Spanish since high school senior year. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, episode nine, fresh off two cracking victories this uh, within the span of, what, th- four days? Yeah, four Saturday, days. Sunday, Monday, Saturday, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, span of four days. Um, you know, it's been uh, it's been pretty nice. Uh, last week, I was begging for a shutout. They gave me two. I wanted yeah. uh, I wanted us to get a two 0 lead at halftime against uh, West Brom, and they got that. So I mean, yeah, Christmas came early for you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, yes, I mean, you know, pretty much just you run down the games. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll just start uh, chronologically. We'll start with the West Brom game on Saturday. Um, in case you weren't, uh, in case you've been living under a rock, Chelsea won two 0 uh, Ben Foster was a beast. He stood on his head, and this game—I don't even want to imagine how bad this game could have been if he wouldn't have been in goal. Yeah, that's a great um, point. He was—he was there. The reason that they did not go, I think, maybe four or five down, and even in the first half. Yeah, yeah, it was. You know, it was. Yeah, it was. It was pretty interesting. Interesting. Uh, it was what the eleventh minute we scored first. Um, Diego Costa got a uh, he received a cross from uh, Oscar and uh, played it beautifully with his chest right to his feet, only where he could hit it, and just you know thunderbolt right to the back of the net. Uh, there were some questions of offside, and I mean it's it's hard to really call that I guess for the linesman, but I think it was a, it was a safe call, and there wasn't really much in it. Maybe a, maybe a, a, a toe. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know from from the referee's point of view, I think it was it was pretty pretty much even. Uh, but you know, like you said, maybe in a toe, you know, matter of a couple inches, maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you can't. It's it's just kind of one of those. It could, it could really go either way. Um, yeah. Nonetheless, though, it was you know it wasn't even 15 minutes later, and you know we we doubled the lead. Eden Hazard, uh, nice little run from the left side. Finally, he got a goal from open play. Yeah, I mean, that's we were we've been talking about that for now three or four episodes. Uh, you know, and the same thing that Mourinho stressed about him becoming an elite player, even though he thinks he's quality, and, and obviously he's, he is. Um, he kept saying what he wanted him to work on was his finishing and his ability just to not just create goal, goals but score them. So I'm sure he was pleased about that as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, he's we all know, you know, what he can do from the from the uh penalty kick spot, but uh I I can't remember off the top of my head when the last uh when his last goal from open play was, but I mean, you know, it, like you said, we we've, we've been talking about it for a couple episodes, so uh probably the uh maybe it's been closer than that. I'm thinking maybe the the first Maribor game. Yeah. Might be his, his last from open play, but um, you know, I mean, it, it's only a matter of time before Hazard finally comes around. And uh, the fact of the matter is, really, we haven't needed him to play exactly on the level this season as what he was last season. So yeah, I mean, he hasn't had to share as much of the load, which is exactly. Great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're not uh, we're not nearly as dependent on him this season as as last season. Not to say that he hasn't taken over games or anything, because he's he's definitely taken over a handful of games, but. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, you, you know, we haven't really needed him to uh, to create as many chances like he did last season with Sesk, so. Yeah, and speaking of, Sesk got the assist for his goal. Yeah, yeah, he did. So, you know, um, that was his, what, 12th assist this season? Jeez. That's, in the Premier League? It's outrageous. Arsenal fans, I hope you're listening. <laughs> uh, I think it was, uh, I believe I saw a tweet, it was uh, the fastest ever to... Uh, it was 12 assists in 10 games, the fastest to 12 assists in the history of the Premier League. Wow, so he's got more than that, because that, that was our 12th fixture, I think. Oh, was it? Or was it 12 and 12th? Uh, let me see if I can find it here. 
One thing I know is that he did not record that many by this time in the season when he was at Arsenal. So, <laughs> And also, uh, he has more assists than any Chelsea player has from the start of last season. Wow. Yeah. It's just, it's... It's immediate it's, impact. Yeah. Yeah, it's insanity. It, it, it really is. But, um, yeah, it looks like I can't... Uh, I don't believe I can. Yeah, I can't. I can't find that. Um, no worries. Done the, or no, that was. <clears throat> I'm sorry. That was his tenth assist in twelve games. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's My what apologies. Thought. Yeah, yeah. So, tenth assist in twelve games. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, he's just he's been an absolute beast. Um, and then uh, it was a couple minutes after Hazard's goal, and uh, I mean, you know. Up until that point, we were just we were dominating the game to begin with. Yeah, it was but, absolute control. Yeah, but I mean, Jakob, I don't even know what he was thinking. He won the ball he, somehow. He won the ball, all right. So that's I know what he was thinking, and I can I can see how he may have been shocked. But with the way that they're stressing the rule about two feet off the ground, regardless of if you're showing studs at a perpendicular angle or if you're just you know jumping. They're going to call that, and I'm surprised. I'm not surprised he showed him the red, to be honest with you. And I think that none of the other players were. No one else protested. Do you see that? Not his team. No one protested. I mean, yeah. And several yeah, and Chelsea players were, you know, nodding their heads yes. So I don't think that many people were outraged. And on, and on second look on the replays, it's, you know, Costa does well to get his leg out of the way, frankly. Yeah, I mean, you could you could say Costa was actually pretty lucky there not to uh, suffer any type of major injury because, like you said, you know he, he got his legs out of the way. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I I don't know if Jakob was was trying to stand on the ball or what. I, I don't I even don't know. He had any? I really don't think he had any intent. I think that was just his what he found to be the best way at the time, and it you know it looks kind of ridiculous, but it was effective. So. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, I don't know if maybe he thought that Costa was going to slide in after the ball and he was going to jump up over him or what. I, I, don't, I don't really know, but, um, I mean, you could see when he's walking off the field, he's not really, he's not really yelling at the ref. He doesn't. You no, know, I, yeah. I, I think, I think he knew. Yeah, and and the commentator for one second said he didn't know, and then the other one kind of convinced him. But I think on. On first look, you can't really see, you couldn't really tell unless you were there. Or I guess unless you had a, a bird's eye view, but I think it was the right call in the end, and it kind of just killed the game off in itself. You know, all the players mentally were. You could see how it really took the steam out of not just West Brom, but a, a couple of Chelsea players as well. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I tweeted sometime during the second half that just the red card. I I I kind of lost interest in the game after that because Chelsea was just. You know, passing the ball around and just you know Wait, keeping possession, waiting for the final whistle. Exactly, and uh, I think Fabregas had something like 153 passes, successful passes this game, or something insane like that. I would believe it. So, I mean, uh, I, I mean, the only other things really that I have on it, there's not really a ton. Um, I wish, I wish I would have gathered notes to talk about the atmosphere because the, the atmosphere. This game was much better. That, but that was, may have been the best part about it. the most exciting part of the that game was the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they kind of died off in the second half, but that's you know it's understandable because you know when they're just kind of playing and the ball the around. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, they're just kind of passing the ball around and keeping possession and, and whatnot. So you know, they they were having a good time singing songs and whatnot. And I, I think that you know, I think uh, I think Mourinho he he recognized that in his post game press conference. I forget exactly what he said, but. Um, you know, I mean, he, he knew that the crowd was, they were into it, you know, they were excited that, uh, you know, they were excited for the game and whatnot, so. Um, then there a couple things, uh, I, I thought Oscar was just phenomenal in this game, just game in and game out, he just, I don't know, it's, it seems like he gets better every game. Um, yeah, he has been getting better, I would agree with that. Last season he, not that he wasn't consistent, but he just had, he was lacking in a little bit of bite. But I think that's not just him. It's the fact that Fabregas is uh, now playing in the deep-lying role. And even though Oscar does come back pretty often and plays both sides of the ball, he's less responsible for that area of the midfield. And he's far more creative and forward-thinking with, with, with his with his play. You can, it shows. Yeah, yeah. And it's this game, it was really apparent that um, 
Oscar and Fabregas together, they just they they controlled the pace of the game. Whatever speed they wanted the game to go, that they decided it. Yeah, and that's what you know. I don't know if anybody saw, but Six Second Savage put up a fantastic line of uh, Chelsea passing in the in the in their backfield, uh, as you would call it, I guess, in America. Yeah, <laughs> they're doing one touch passing from literally from the goal line. Fabregas two steps someone on his goal line and then plays it to Hazard, who plays it back to Fabregas, who plays it to Oscar, who back behind the back flicks it to Oscar to Hazard, and then it's back to Fabregas and it's back to Hazard, and then it was just it was a, it was a whirlwind of of classy one touch passing, and it bewildered the the West Brom def, uh, players, even though they were in Chelsea's uh, defensive third, and it really spoke volumes about, I guess. The, the confidence and self belief that Chelsea have been showing recently. Yeah, and I, the the gif of it was on um, it was on the the Chelsea sub or the uh, R slash soccer subreddit or something. Oh yeah, it was on one of the front pages. That, I don't know if it was if it was your vine or the the gif, but um, it was something like uh, you'll never guess whose end this this takes mm-hmm. place in or something like that. Because yeah, okay. it just it, it looked like Chelsea was. Like it was in their attacking end when they were, you know, they were just kind of knocking the ball around. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the only other thing uh, that I have, and it's not really, it's not really anything major, but uh, Tony Gale, he's just, he was one of the commentators in this game, in case you weren't aware. But oh yeah, uh, I just I thought that neither one of the commentators were really really good, but um, you know, that's just kind of minor takeaways on. That's just kind of nitpicky, but I don't know. He went on some rant about Ivanovich being a diver and stupid shit like that. And it, it was just annoying. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. I forget what point. It, it was after it was already uh, it was already two 0 and and West Brom was down to ten men. Uh, Ivanovich went down in uh, West Brom's box. I don't even remember. The, there was contact made, but it it wasn't it wasn't penalty kick worthy, but. Uh, he he went on some spiel about Ivanovich being a diver, but <laughs> yeah, but Sour it, commentators. people just don't like Chelsea. That's fine. I enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I honestly, I you know. And to be fair, I did I did take a line of of Ivanovich diving horrendously and winning a penalty in <laughs> Maribor game. I think it was it was horrendous. I'm sorry. I'll admit it. That's fine. But I wouldn't label him a diver. No, no. I I I really wouldn't either. Um. But yeah, I mean, you know, other than that, you know, it's it's nice to get three points, and we're um, probably should have brought this up before the uh, probably should have pulled this up before we started. But we're what like six points clear, Southampton at the top. At the top, yeah, we're now full six points clear, two full minute wins. Uh-huh. Yeah, man, that's insane. Southampton has conceded six goals this season. This I season, it's crazy. It really is crazy. But they but, get to face the big boys. And I exactly. Think, I think that this is going to be a true test for them. So, Exactly. They face Chelsea, Arsenal, United, and they have a couple of ring of games, and they have Arsenal, United, Chelsea, and like, not necessarily in that order, but just they're going to be playing a lot of good teams, and I think that this is going to be a wake-up call. I don't know if it's going to be necessarily their, their make or break. I mean, it won't be their break, but it might be... You know the deciding factor for their season because yeah, I think that you know if, if they're still here, if they're still you know second or third by uh, New Year's Day, then you know I think that we can, I think we can say you know all right, the, this team is for real. I'm far more interested in City. Um, they sit eight points back, and you know they, the way they've been looking recently, they've been relying on several key players to really pull them out of games. Aguero, namely. Who's been ridiculous, um, and I'm just so, I'm wondering to see if they can keep that form up or if they're going to need you know some some bolstering in January. And I honestly just feel so confident about our squad that it's you know it's kind of just, I just want to see who really was going to put up the biggest fight because I really don't see us faltering um, at any point. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, anytime I you know look at the table, I I try and I try and see you know. I don't really, as of right now, like like we said, you know, Southampton really has yet to play, quote, the big boys. Like, they played Liverpool, they lost to Liverpool. I'm not saying that Liverpool's a big boy this season, they're 12th right now, but uh, typical, you know, like top seven teams. Um, they played, uh, they lost to Liverpool, and is, uh, is Spurs their other loss? I think so. 
I feel yeah, I think that Liverpool because the Liverpool game was the first game of the the season. I know that they lost that one. I think Spurs was their second one. But yeah, I mean they they play. Uh, shout out to uh, Mark Nichols on Twitter uh, at Nicholsodian. <laughs> uh, writes at Chelsea Index with Omni uh, for you know pointing out that uh, you know that me and Omni mentioned last podcast you know that they have uh, I think they have City Arsenal then Man U coming up and then I think they play like Palace and then Chelsea and then someone and then Everton so you know I mean they got uh, kind of like how you know Chelsea just got over this this you know a big challenge recently of. You know, we we had City, we had Arsenal, we had Liverpool, we had Man United, um, plus we had Everton back in September. So, you know, we kind of had that tough stretch there. So Southampton's, you know, they're they're coming up. So you know, we're gonna find out how good that team is. Exactly. Um. So yeah, I mean, do you do you have anything? Uh, just anything else about the Premier League table or uh, uh, the West Brom game? Just to wrap up before we move along to Schalke. Um. <clears throat> no, just. That despite our two goal defeat of West Brom, they've they've conceded fewer goals than Liverpool. So just a shout out to Liverpool. Oh yeah, wow. Yeah they have. Wow, that's uh <laughs> The two the two Merseyside clubs, despite being, you know, in ninth and twelfth, have conceded more goals than the teams in sixteenth and seventeenth. Wow, that yeah, that's insane. Yeah, and plus, um, you know, Chelsea's Chelsea got a uh, thirty-two points right now, and if I am correct, yeah, they have uh, they have more points than North London with uh, Arsenal and Spurs. They have thirty-one points combined. Exactly. So you know, we're and, sitting. Go ahead. And more points than you know the the relegation. Three, but that's no surprise. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's uh, the Premier League table. It's slowly starting to shape up. Uh, we're kind of a third of the way through the season. Um, next game, you could say that we're uh, that we're past the you know the one third, uh, yep. the thirty three percent mark. So you know the, the the table's starting to starting to shape up. We certainly have a nice nice little cushion right now. So yep, you know. And we're through, we're through November pretty much. Yeah, we just you know we uh, our November Blues. I don't want to say that they're you know that they're over with, but we got we got one more battle to fight in November. You know we're uh, what four four wins, one draw, no losses, obviously in, in November. Uh, I think the yeah the Maribor or Mar- yeah. Was yeah, it was the Maribor game we drew. Or no, or no. yeah, yeah, it was No, we we drew the Schalke game. At home? No, no, in November. I'm not sure what you're asking. Which uh which game was it that we drew? Oh in Maribor, November? Maribor, yeah. It was Maribor? Okay. That's what I thought. So yeah, I mean, you know, we got we got the four wins, you know, in the draw and uh in Maribor, so you know uh, the the draw against Maribor, so sit nicely at the top, nice and cozy up there. So moving along to uh, when you're listening to this, um, probably Wednesday, maybe Thursday, but uh, Tuesday's uh, five five nil result over Schalke, um, just total domination. Um, I I feel that it was kind of. Uh, like an anticlimactic mood, sort of leading up to the game, just because I was I was kind of expecting more with uh, the uh, Di Matteo and Chelsea um, storyline. Yeah. But, you know there you know there wasn't really there wasn't really a ton there, and you know not to say that there had to be that you know it had to be made into a soap opera or anything like that, but I just I was just expecting uh, expecting more uh, about it. But then again, I mean we all know that Fox Sports's soccer coverage is piss poor so I mean uh, Mourinho wasn't having any of that though I think that he deflected all talk of you know camaraderie and special moments with Di Matteo and all that he was like no yeah he, he was like we're here to win and uh, we, can, we can smile and grab ass after the game but I'm here to get the W and I don't care how badly I take it out on him clearly yeah so. and I, I, I think even Di Matteo uh, sort of deflected that as well 
um, the other day. So, yeah, I mean, you know, two minutes in, just, well, not not even two minutes in. It was like a minute and 15 seconds in. Diego Costa just goes on this unreal run. Um, and he's, he, it's like one on four against our back line. And uh, the, the one uh, center back, he, you know, he's kind of pinching over, and uh, Costa gets in the box, gets a shot off. It it probably should have went in, but at the same time, the keeper probably should have saved it and it not have gone out for a corner. Uh, went between his legs, and uh, whenever he went to kind of close his legs up, it kind of hit him in the in the foot, and he uh, he went kicked back it out. Way. But, I still yeah. haven't a lot of times. I'm surprised because Costa pulled that on on Tim Howard away at Everton. Yeah. Uh, and he, he has a knack for that. Like, and he doesn't, I know it's like, it isn't his, his isn't the necessary quality for a striker, but he doesn't necessarily look the part. You know, he's kind of ungainly. He's, he's tall. He's a bigger guy, but he has a technical ability that he, that belies his size. And I think that it's, uh, it's, it's one of his better assets because a lot of players try to muscle him off the ball, but he's able to, his, his talents with the ball are, are able to, you know, aid him in those situations. So. It's yeah. To see him also making those run in, runs in behind because he's also capable of of you know taking the long ball and and so on. So he's very versatile and he showed that definitely in this game. Yeah, yeah. He just he has when the ball comes to him, it's just like he he plays it like it's on a string. Like you know he he plays it. He knows how far how to push it out ahead of him to know that he's going to be able to muscle the guy off, and that's. It's he, he kind of has like this uncanny ability to take guys one on one because like you said he, you know he's kind of he's big he's kind of rugged and uh, you know he doesn't he's not slow but you know he doesn't have all this he, did, he you know he doesn't have a ton of pace but yet you know he still takes guys one on one and just wins successfully just out of just brute force and just you know wanting the ball more than the other guy exactly and. Um, yeah, I mean, Fabregas, you know, he picked up another assist on the corner kick, uh, placed perfectly for Terry. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was one nil up like a minute and a half into the game. And, uh, you know, it, it was – Schalke did, really didn't have a chance. They they didn't really stand a chance after that. I mean, they're uh, – they had that one – the one shot that was deflected, but I think that was after uh, – after the William goal, which you know we we talked about before we started, and I'll I'll let you go ahead into, you know what you what you inform me about with the William goal. Oh, uh, the well, yeah, they're they're deflect they're deflected off the crossbar shot happened in between uh, our first and second goals, which was actually oh okay, it was actually a good thing that you know we were that was probably their best effort um, and. It was also their their I think their strategy to try to attack Hazard's side, assuming he wouldn't be playing defense. And thankfully, they were wrong because um, he really busted his ass back there. But for our goal um, and our second goal, rather from the run of play instead of a set piece, Fabregas uh, really did. I think he's the one we should focus on for this because even though Willian and Hazard worked a good one-two prior to the finish, it was Fabregas's movement. Um, and awareness of positioning that really freed up the space. So in about the 28th, 29th minute, you can see Fabregas go over to to look at Mourinho, and you can see he's motioning, and eventually he, motion, he points forward, and then in the next play he switches with Oscar, and he maintains a higher position almost all the way up on the back line uh, of, of Schalke. And you can see he's demanding the ball, and Hazar and Oscar are doing their best to, to feed him the ball there. And as soon as he gets it, he turns and plays it in because all the sp- all the space that's now freed as a defender came to play him is open for players to run in behind. And Oscar, Hazar, and Willian are all doing so at breakneck pace. Um, and all he has to do is play a simple ball in to Willian, who flicks on for Hazar, and then he plays it back to Willian, and he finishes a rather simple move. But it looks so fluid because of Fabregas' subtle positioning, and he's just so good at that uh without drawing much attention to himself he you know he's he's really good at just opening up plays like that and creating space for other players yeah yeah and i william he might be my favorite player to watch score because he doesn't score very often but he just he works his ass off yeah he does like he he just he runs so much he's all over the field and it's just he's just you know he's 
he's the guy that he just deserves. He deserves a goal. You just, you know, you look at the way he plays and whatnot. Especially in this game. Like, I think he ran, I, I can't think of a piece of the field he didn't touch. You know, he, he was everywhere. And yeah, his explosive runs through the middle freed up so many counterattacks. And it was as if he was, like, with the ball at his feet, he was blowing by his Schalke defenders. And it, I was just amazed. And that's the way I, he looked when he was when he was at Shakhtar. That's, that's the way he looked, you know, and we were, that's why we wanted him so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, unfortunately remember how he played at Shakhtar, but yeah, I mean, you know, he's, he played very well today, and again, the interchangeability of, of Hazard and Willian and Oscar across, you know, if you want to consider them all attacking midfielders, just the way they interchange positions, you know, Hazard goes in the middle and Oscar will go out right, and Willian will go all the way across the field and go to the left, and you know, it just, they never, they never let the opposing team's back line get comfortable, because, uh, you know, once you think you have Hazard figured out, well, you know, Oscar's coming over there, and Williams going to the center of the field. Exactly, it's just and, much interchanging. It's it's hard to track, and players sometimes are caught out of position because they feel like they might be needing to go and play it. You know, play deeper or farther forward. And it's really great to see them develop an understanding like that. Yeah, yeah, and like, and like you said, uh, Fabregas just has he has this ability just to get into these little like interesting places on the field that you wouldn't really suspect him to get to just be, just excuse me just kind of looking at at the type of player he is and whatnot um and then i i, I remember there was another uh there was a an over the top ball that he made at some point in this game it everything kind of ran together in this game just with all the goals and stuff but he played this over the top ball to oscar that was just unbelievable and it was he was only like oh, yeah. he only yeah. he only played it like ten yards yep. as far exactly. as distance. Yeah, it's just but it's just the top. Oscar hit that on the volley, and like it, both him and uh, Diego Costa were both in behind and, and on side. So yeah, because then the, the keeper uh, the keeper saved it right, and then it it went out of bounds, and Costa yeah. and the keeper were both running after it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's great, yeah. Fabregas. You can on the replay you see him. You know, the first thing he gets the ball and he's looking up. You know, he's already looking up, and he just. Gauges the space, plays an immaculate ball over the top that only Oscar or, or Costa can get to, and you know it's just in the blink of an eye. You know he's creating some magic like out of nothing, pretty much. And I think that's one of you know we miss that not just the creativity but the f- forward thinking creativity. You know he's he's a, a midfield player who can sit back and, and and watch plays develop, but also create them himself, and it, it's a rare talent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, I saw that there was. I haven't read the article yet. I just haven't. I haven't got the time to read it. But I saw it uh, tonight while I was at work, and it was something like um, something to do with uh, how Fabregas is. Um, I forget the most uh, creative midfielder in this current Premier League era or, era or something like that. I can't. I can't remember exactly how the, the title was worded. Oh yeah, I think I saw the same article. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you know, he's just <laughs> he's unreal. Um, and then, uh, you know, Schalke was, they were grinding. They were, they were trying to just get to the locker room, the, the locker room, only down 2 0. And then I think it was the 44th minute. Um, Kirchhoff, he just, oh my God, an absolute thunder bastard of a header. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, like was, he buried it. He buried it. Yeah, he did. He, he really did. I mean, that was just, that was strange. I, I don't even know why. He was, he was only up against his own player. That's the thing I, did, I didn't get. He literally was only jumping against his own center back. And I and I watched our player fall and thought there may have been a foul. And then I watched his player head it in. And I, and I was just confused. But I think that really epitomized Schalke's, uh, Schalke's defending today, especially when it came to our, our you know, Run of play attacks, not necessarily set pieces, but we were more dominant. I, I would, I would argue, on set pieces. And it, this is a team that Mourinho was stressing was tall and would be dangerous for corners and such. So, I think that we did well against that. I think we were up for the challenge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I mean, <laughs> Schalke just they they didn't they didn't stand a chance after after going down three 0 They just didn't because with the way that Chelsea just shut things down and, you know, retain possession and stuff against West Brom, you know, they were going to do the same against Schalke. And uh, Schalke's already playing shorthanded. Draxel was hurt. Um, uh, I can't remember who the hell else was hurt. But, you know, they, they had a, 
they had like three defenders that were hurt and a couple midfielders and a, a, a striker that's on the bench that was hurt. Yeah, they had to shuffle around some players. Hoedis was playing on the left left back instead of playing in the center back where he normally does. And it was just, you know, they had uh, they had their own issues going on, especially right now in the Bundesliga that we don't need to really touch on. But they're definitely not a team who are at the peak form, if any, right now. So we did kind of take advantage of that. And I like the fact that we were ruthless, um, that we continued pressing on until literally the end. Uh, and it shows. It sends a message to all the other teams in the, in, the, in the Champions League that we've qualified and we qualified. I like to say, I guess, in style. Yeah, and I, I would say, uh, I would say comfortably. I mean, you know, it was. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I don't really know if, if anyone. Uh, you could argue Bayern Munich, um, but you know, other than that, I don't really know if anyone's really cruised to clinching the group. I think uh, so, that actually it's funny that you say that, but the only other group who has, only other team who has, is Shakhtar, and they have the highest score in the in the Champions League currently in uh, Adriano. But they've looked good, and I, I, you can argue that they didn't have the, the toughest group, but neither did we. So right, yeah, I mean, the only, yeah, group, I, only two teams who have who have uh, made it to the knockout stages, the two of us. That's the only the only two that have clinched the top of the group, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but we have, as Mourinho said in this post-match comments, we we don't necessarily need to win the next game, but obviously we're going to try to win. But we can we can look ahead to other games now that we don't have to have that pressure on us to go to, I mean, to have to deal with Portugal, uh, rather Sporting. Yes, yeah. Um, let me just refresh this just because I'm not curious. Well, this is well, I'm trying to f- figure this out. Uh, who uh, did Sporting win today? Yeah, they did. Okay. So. Sporting is now on five points. Schalke is now on seven points. Or no. Sporting is now on seven, I think. Schalke is on five. Yeah. Maribor yeah. is on three. Yes. Yeah. Because Mar- Maribor was on three before this game. Okay. And Sporting was on four before this game, and Schalke was on five. All right, cool. So Sporting's at seven now, so they're the most likely to qualify second from the group. And... Um, the thing is, we just have to either tie... We don't need to not lose to them essentially, so we can go first. But I think that won't be that much of an issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here's um, so here's uh, here's our fixtures um around the sporting game. The game before is against Newcastle, but there's a three day rest in between there, and then the game after sporting is which the sporting game's on a Wednesday. The game after that is Hall City on Saturday, and the one after that is Derby County on Tuesday. So. Oh, that's the Capital One Cup. Yeah, so you know, I mean, I I think that I think we'll see some you know some rotation in there, but today uh, definitely see I, some fresh faces. Yeah, yeah, and I I noticed before the game that there was kind of some uh, some Chelsea supporters that were kind of confused as to why we didn't rotate the squad in this game, but it was just we needed to go and we needed to collect a victory. I agree. And, I'm, I'm so yeah. happy you said that. I'm happy you actually drew attention to that because I was reading the same tweets where you probably were. Yeah. And like, it's, we need you this. Know, we need to send a message. We need to kick asses. Like, I don't understand that. We need to win games. And this is a competition we want to win, period. Like, this is one of the biggest competitions that this club competes in. Exactly. No, Not secondary to the Premier League, you know? So I think that this is definitely something that we need to talk about. Like, people need to know that how seriously Mourinho takes this and how seriously he has the team taking it. Exactly, and and there's not as as far as priority, there it, it, it's one A and one B with the with the Premier League and Champions League. Exactly. Mourinho doesn't. M- Mourinho aims to win both. He doesn't aim, you know, to to play one. And he he built this squad to compete seriously, compete in both. Exactly. Like, legitimately compete in both. Yeah. And people don't realize that, like, or I don't know if they just forget, but the West Brom game was our first game after the international break, and we had multiple guys that were. Staying in London or wherever, you know, uh, just resting. working out, they, it, resting and whatnot. Like we had multiple players that didn't go out and play for their international squad, so we had a lot of guys that were fit. And the key was Diego Costa. He was, he was fit. He didn't go out to, you know, play for Spain. Him nor Sa- Fabregas. Yeah, both of them were were on point. Absolutely. Exactly, and I, I. I I honestly, I don't think that uh, that Costa was. Um, I he didn't really have a very great game today, but we didn't need him to. 
Yeah, he was he was just ever present. You know, he did his did his work. He made he made the Dak line work hard for Schalke. And I think as what you were saying about you know the players who were fresh from this week, Fabregas said he had his best game or his best half of football he'd ever played um, against West Brom. Correct. Yeah, and yeah, it was something like he said that that was that was his most fun half of football of his, of his career, career or something like yeah, that, which is like a very bold statement considering he's played at Arsenal and Barcelona with yeah like Neymar. And yeah, Messi. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't really get much much bigger than you know playing at you know three you know extremely famous clubs and you know huge worldwide clubs. So yeah, I mean that's that's quite that's quite a compliment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, there was no need for rotation today. The only one you could argue is uh, Felipe Luis getting in there just because it seems to be that that's yeah. where he's getting his time at. But at the same time, it seems like uh, it seems like if Ivanovic is fit, Ivanovic is going to play. Yeah. So Espli Quetta, who is honestly, I think that the same thing goes for him. I think if he's fit, he should play as well. Exactly, yeah. As you said, though, I mean, I think you said in the last podcast, or where we both did it, that we suspected or we expected Felipe Luis would be on the on the starting lineup. So I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think we were wrong to assume that because Mourinho's been going with him in every Champions League match. But it's good to see Aspel getting his first game in Champions League as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um,. One other thing that I just I thought was kind of uh, I like how we just kind of we just kind of forgot about the second half, but you know there there We're wasn't really going into it. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we'll get there. But like uh, something I thought was interesting was that uh, that Remy wasn't in the eighteen. Yeah. I, um, remember we said last we were talking about it last episode about he had I think he had they had tried to rush him back from fitness and then he had either not been fit and he had an issue. Yeah, I think it was his groin. I'm not. I'm not completely sure, but I think we had mentioned it in the last episode, and I meant to research it, but I'm, I, I really have to take another look at that. I'm not sure about why he wasn't in the 18, but I mean, the way drug has been playing, I don't really know if he's number three anymore. Yeah, and that's that's another thing is that it seems like Drogba is just he's just as legitimate of a resource on the bench as what Remy is. Yeah, like. I agree. Um, and it seems like Mourinho's going to him more often. Then again, it could be that Remy's just injured. So, but right, Drogba's yeah, I mean, definitely showing up and putting in performance whenever he's called upon. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't find anything on Remy and why he's not playing. It could just be the you know the the groin issue or whatever it was that is just kind of it's kind of lingering. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean that that would make sense because injuries like that that's what they do they just linger and. Um, you know, it's not really, it's not really an injury that that you want to mess around with. So, um, but yeah, I mean, first half, you know, was just absolutely dominant. A little halftime note here. Uh, again, Fox Sports One just absolutely terrible. Um, I don't know if you heard the commercial that they have for. Um, is Ars- Arsenal's playing Dortmund this uh, this match day? Tomorrow, yeah. Okay, so they're. Uh, the commercial for it, instead of Dortmund, it it says Dortmand. Like Dortmand. <laughs> Dortmand. Nice, nice. Yeah, uh, I just very, I was very classy. Yeah, like I, I was looking down at my laptop typing up something or I can't remember, and, and I heard Arsenal Dortmund, and I'm I, I looked up like uh what, who, huh? I don't I don't know of a Dortmand. Uh, nonetheless, uh, going into the second half, uh, Chelsea, uh, whoever the social media intern is or, or whatever it is, if it's a full-time position, just absolutely taking the piss on Arsenal. Yes. Uh, with the, tweet. The, the, the Blues going for goal number four here, aware that a 3-0 lead can be a dangerous one in the Champions League. For those that aren't aware, which it, it kind of took me a second to be like, what the hell are they talking about? It's and then so- to remember that uh, you know, Arsenal's blown uh three 0 lead against Anderlecht uh last match day. So yeah, that was just that was you know, the the players on the field were having fun and you know the the the, the social media account, you know, they're just they were having a little bit of fun. Having their it, fun so. too. Our second half I think was really comprehensive. I have like a I have like a good a good amount of like things to run down if you wanna just touch upon it. That's perfect because really the only things I have is just uh, 
you know, Drogba, Drogba looked phenomenal he, in the second yeah. half. His, his, and, he was good, and his, I only, only take away, I mean, the only things that I would take away from his game was that he was uh, slow to work into the to the flow of the offense when he first came in. He was holding the ball a little long and trying to take more touches than necessary, and I think our, our, our offense kind of requires a, a quick one-two punch, if you know what I mean. So he kind of yeah, worked I, I, himself in, though. Yeah, I think it just it kind of requires uh, like a fluidity to, to it. Exactly. And, uh, just holding on to it, and I don't think that really works for us anymore. Yeah, and um, it, the only other thing I have is just that uh, if 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 Ivanovic would have converted on that volley, that would have been oh yeah, that, that was just oh my god, that would have been one of the goals of the tournament. Yeah. That was just that was unreal. And that was William who set it up, and I think he was he was a huge part of it. But here I'll go. Uh, I'll start early in the second half. Uh, just. 48th minute, Costa, as the announcer said, Costa bullied Santana, and he advanced on goal, and Santana's last ditch challenge uh, kicked it away. And one thing I wasn't pleased with, Hazard went and took the corner and hit the first man, and I hate when that happens. You should never be hitting the first man. You should always be getting it into the danger area. Like, our, our center backs are up, and that's an easy way for a team to counter on us. I was really unsure why it wasn't Fabregas, but anyways, again, in the 51st minute, we won another corner, and... Uh, I mean, we, we, we conceded corner, rather, and Costa, who's playing defense, just like a, a really great striker does, in my opinion, he sprints at the person with the ball, he wins it, and he does extremely well to start the counter via Oscar, who then finds William. And honestly, I thought William should have scored, um, but he like really unselfishly tried to find Hazard, and he just failed at doing so. But seconds later, and this is what we were talking about before, in Fabregas and Oscar's and William's interchangeability, Schalke tried to counter, and Fabregas does the dirty work. He moves back in midfield um, and recycles the possession. And I think that after the break, I think Di Matteo must have told his players to press us higher so that he could maybe stifle the distribution or you know, try to put some press on us so we hit some longer balls. But that really only freed up the ball in behind, which uh, led to Hazard cross and a forced clearance by Schalke. So, and, and with a player like Fabregas, he can always pick those balls out, and he knows that as soon as he gets it, Costa's going to make the run in behind whether or not he kicks it. Um, so around the 57th minute, I think Hazard picked up a knock, and it was like the whole team felt a momentary slump. And Schalke did have some success attacking down our left side because Hazard was literally you know, walking around in pain. And that was one of their best chances. So I think that it... Yeah, let me... Go, go ahead, ahead. And finish up, and then oh, just, that's, no, go ahead. That was that's feel free. Okay, so yeah, that was uh, that was. I I just want to say that that part was just that that was scary. Uh, I was, I think I was finishing up an article for my uh, for my actual job, and uh, and I I was typing, and I heard um, I heard the announcer say something like uh, Hazard is down and looks to be in pain, and I looked up, and the play was still going on. Yeah. And he just it it, was, it took him a couple minutes like it was like you know everything kind of stood still and know, it took him like, a, like the whole team was like they were hurt you know it was like what yeah what about, yeah what Aiden what happened <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, I mean it I couldn't even I couldn't really imagine I was really yeah, actually I felt the way you did I was really worried they kept saying he like he seems to be in pain and they cut over to him and he's you know, bending over and touching his leg and, and kind of walking around and generally not looking like he's able to continue. And then about a minute and a half later, they pass to him and he passes it back and he's all right. So, yeah, it's something something that I wonder if I, I wonder if he was pissed off about it because it was like right after he got up off the ground, the ball came back to the left side. Yeah, and he had to do it. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, like right as soon as you know he got up into the you know, into our attacking third. Yeah. He got the ball immediately. Exactly. And like you said, he just immediately he just passed right, right back. back. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was just, yeah, that was, uh, everything. I kind of just stopped what I was, what I was doing. Cause you know, I had, uh, I had higher priorities like hazards health that I had to worry about. Exactly. But, but, uh, but yeah, continuing on. Yeah. In the 66th, Drogba came on for Costa and Costa actually picked up a knock as well. Or so said Jose. Um, and as he came off, Jose gives him a pat on the back. We went right down the tunnel, and I'm happy that he got a solid rest after playing, what, 120 minutes plus in the last two matches? Yeah. Um, and then the 70th, Hazar, as we were just saying, he was looking injured. He's breaking his neck to get back on defense, and we're 3-0 up with 20 minutes left, and I love that. You know, um, Regardless of if he's 
looking like he picked up a knock, he's still willing to put you know put in a shift on the defensive end, especially. Um, in the 75th minute, Ramirez came on for Oscar and another pat on the back from Jose. And I like the I like the way that the players respond to him. I know it's like people don't really value it, but I think the player manager uh, relationship is huge. And I think Jose does it better than most coaches. But yeah, there's there seems to be like a the there's such a I mean, you know, with all clubs, you can say there's a connect you know between the players and manager because they're just there has to be. But there has to be. <laughs> but it's just I don't know with Jose, it's different. Yeah, and even other pl- past players, players who uh, R- Ronaldo ha- did an interview recently. Cristiano Ronaldo. He's talking about um, he was talking about a couple of the players, but I think he was talking about Willian and uh, maybe Oscar, and talking about how good they're going to get playing under Mourinho, and yeah. and how he makes players better just the way he manages them, the way he understands them. So, I think if someone like Cristiano Ronaldo is saying that, who plays at the you know at some of the high, um, some of the best clubs and under some of the most talented managers, for him to be saying that Mourinho gets the best out of his players is quite a quite a compliment. Yeah, and it's just it's something that Mourinho has been really good at throughout the throughout the length of his career. That you know, not a, like you know, he's the manager, so I mean, you know, he manages the team, the, you know, the the tactics we do, the formations, the substitutions, yeah. stuff like that. But he also he's he's a really good manager of personalities, and you know, he he knows what to do with with players and you know like if if they're really outspoken to the media and stuff and stuff like that he just he knows how to manage people exactly um, and it, it, not not just in a you know a, a soccer skills performance perspective however you want to say yeah he's a he's definitely you know building a good relationship with each of the players and that's also i think factors into his transfer policy as you just touched upon <clears throat> yeah so and i I, I think that it's just uh I don't know, like, you know, there was some some bad blood sort of between uh uh Iker Casillas and Mourinho and uh and Ramos was in there as well, right? Ramos didn't really care for Mourinho. Yeah, I think he may have said something and I think the uh that I think Mourinho said may have responded to his comments about uh Costa and Fabregas not joining the Spanish team only because the two of them didn't Really, I don't know. Maybe the two of them did get along. I'm not sure if it was him or Pepe and him and Ramos, but regardless, uh, his former players, he's not the most loved by some of the some of the players at Real Madrid. Yeah, but I, I don't really think anyone gets along with Pepe. I think people just kind of deal <laughs> with him. Ramos, he just kind of puts up with him. Yeah. Or at least I know that's what I do because you know Pepe is yeah, just. Pepe looks uh, like the. Yeah. Yeah, like it, I mean, if if I'm starting a street fight, and I mean he's first pick. Yeah, he but, comes with me for that. But yeah, absolutely. I don't think I want to associate with him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not someone that you know that uh, that I would invite over for dinner or something. So. Yeah. All right, let me just finish up here. Last 15 minutes of the match, uh, Fabregas in the 76 sees William and Drugba making a run in behind William, who I honestly think is maybe our most unselfish player currently because he's doing everything he can to find other people instead of scoring. Is that Willie? Yeah, he, yeah. The assist to Drug was 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 casual and generous because he probably could have finished it himself. But <laughs> I like I like the fact that he's got his head up and he's always looking to, to distribute. And this is the William that we signed. You know, this is the William who was doing amazing things for Shakhtar and, and literally dragging them, carrying them on his back into into uh, Champions League uh, recognition. And Ramirez, two minutes later. Uh, uh, scores from Drugwas cross, which was a really immaculate left foot cross, uh, put it on his head. But credit to Hazard for winning the ball and finding Drugwa because the the over the top ball was, <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think that was probably Fabregas's last uh, involvement in the match, and it was another hockey assist, as you might say. Yeah, yeah. Because he had the one that was to Willian as well. Think about that. Like Fabregas is in, is. Whether he's providing the assist or not, his involvement is undeniable on most every goal because his 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 knowledge of, of when to move to, to allow for space for other players really does free them up to, to go on and either score or create for themselves. So that is a key example of that. And then in the next minute after Ramirez's goal, Shirley comes on for Fabregas. And as usual, there was an embrace and some kind words from Jose. And I like the fact that, as we were touching upon last episode, Andre had a chance to impress, um, and he didn't do poorly. Um, he was definitely on a mission to to get that sixth goal, uh, and 
unfortunately he didn't do so. But in 82nd minute, as we love to hear, carefree wherever you may be, rung around the Schalke away stadium, as it already had multiple times. And it was just nice to put the cap on a 5-0 away victory in the Champions League. Something that Jose said afterwards is something that's not normal. You know, especially to win 5-0 anywhere, especially away for a team in the Champions League. It's, it's definitely an accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we've we've won... Uh... Let's see. We played five uh, five Champions League games, and uh, one game we won five nil on the road, and then you know we also won one uh, six nil, which was at home. So I mean, you know, like like you said, and like Jose said, you know, it's not it's not something that's that you normally see in Champions League. I mean, I think there have been, I think Shakhtar beat uh, Bate or uh, whoever it was in our group. I think they beat him like six or seven nothing earlier this. Year. It might have actually been the same day that Chelsea beat Maribor six 0 but yeah, I mean, there's not there's not really a ton of uh, a ton of games where teams just just go on an absolute goal scoring rampage like Chelsea did today. Yeah. It's um, a sign of our, I think it's a sign of our confidence. Like the 85th to 90th minute, were just complete possession and domination, and just just killing it off. Yeah, and I, I'd like to think that that my one of my first thoughts after the game, after the final whistle, was that this this is how the first game should have gone. Because if you remember, we had just we had so many chances in that first game that we we probably could have had five or six goals in the first game against Schalke. I agree. And, you know, we ended up we ended up drawing one uh one one. They just you know, they they caught us on a, a break. It was unlucky but you well, know, think about it, they had that same kind of opportunity today and they hit the post, so yeah, exactly. Oh, can I just exactly. say one thing? I'm sorry we didn't even get into this, but Cahill, um, the reason that was made possible was Cahill did his classic back away from the ball instead of go pressure it. Um, and like against Liverpool, he had a deflection for a goal, for almost a goal, and it would have wrong-footed Courtois because it was definitely going in, obviously, hit the post to stop it. But that kind of play invites players to either shoot or take you want and gets blocks in but I think in the 30th minute he had a uh, he got caught out on the left and it was necessary for another player to come in and save him because he got caught out so it was just two weak points that I wanted to touch on that I had forgotten about but besides that I think we were completely defensively solid yeah yeah I think that just overall we were solid Montic again just absolute rock in the in the middle of the field, he was unbelievable again. Watch he's and, just getting better if that's even possible. Exactly, and it, it's funny that <laughs> that we're slowly seeing stuff that that me and you that you and I knew all along that Montic is the best defensive midfielder in the Premier League, and now people outside of Chelsea fans are finally they're seeing that and recognizing that. Like, yeah. it was hilarious to see today. Um, on Twitter, just following my timeline throughout the game of people that are Arsenal fans or Liverpool fans or Man United fans that are like, even Man City fans that are like, you know, Montic, he he's the real deal. He's he's the best defensive midfielder in the Premier League and maybe even best defensive midfielder in the world. Um, you know, I mean, he's just... Yeah, he's, he's redeveloping that role in his own way and it's kind of amazing to see that happen at, at the highest level and playing with players like... Uh, Oscar and Fabregas and players who were in front of him like that because he's really providing a, a, uh, a crucial part of our, our, our distribution and, and counterattacking process by, A, winning the ball and breaking up counterattacks for the other team, but also having an eye for where to distribute it to and who to distribute it to. It's, uh, it's really a, a, an impressive skill to have, and I think that his vision is what sets him apart from just being a, a break-up play defender. Mikel could break up play. Mikel was not a poor defender. But his decision-making as far as going forward and also uh, adjusting to pressure is, is not as, as, as well and fine-tuned as, as, as someone like Matic. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, outside of, uh, outside of Mikel's uh, back heel assist earlier oh, in the season. Oh, man, back heel <laughs> against Everton, but I love me. I'll never forget that. Yeah, but yeah, I mean that was just, you know that's <laughs> you know if it was Oscar or Hazard or oh, Willian, yeah. you know, like you you would expect that type of thing. Exactly. But just you know, saying it from Mikel, you just you know you you don't expect no, it. Um, something special. But yeah, going back to the Cahill thing, I would agree. I think that that was 
if you want to look at a negative from today, that and it's not it like you said, it's not just today. He's done it multiple times in the past. Um, just continually backing down from players. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yes. Yeah. I mean. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean. Uh, but other than that, uh, Drogba. I don't know if you saw this or not, but um, his goal today was his 50th goal in European competitions. He's the first African player to reach that milestone. Yeah, I did see that. So yeah, I mean, I just uh, I've I've said it. I think I said it like two podcasts ago. But yeah, I mean, I've I for the most part I've been a fan of of pretty much all of our uh, all of the African players that we've had yeah. in the squad throughout the recent years. And I think it's amazing since we've had the the Abramovich era, we've had a lot of African players, especially when Mourinho was around the first time. I think there were you know there were actually a ton in our in our spine in the spine of our team rather. Yeah, so, yeah, and that's that's <clears> the the. It's, you know, we have, um, what do we have, three on the squad right now? Yeah, we have Sla, uh, Mikel, Drogba. And Drogba. And I think that's it. I think so. I'm pretty sure. If we're wrong, someone call us out. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like you said, like, you know, back then, excuse me, the, the those, you know, those guys were the spine of the team, so. But yeah, I mean, I, I think other than that, um, uh, yeah, I don't really think that there's, Really, anything else to take from today's game other oh. than this? That... I, have a, I have just a couple of post nice thoughts. One of them is about fitness. Obviously, you and I already mentioned this. Uh, our fitness is mm-hmm. great, I think, currently. Uh, Costa was the only worry, but Marino confirmed he'll be fit to face Sunderland, and he only just picked. Dude, it was, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it was it was so nice to see him come out of the game before, like you know, because. Usually it's like within the last five yeah, minutes, yeah. stoppage time. They bring saying him out, last but... episode, yeah, he doesn't get enough time to just really relax. So I think that 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 was awesome. I agree with you. I was so happy seeing him come off early. It was the sixty-six, I think. Yeah, I think it was. I'm pretty sure it was just before the seventieth minute. Mm. So it was nice. It was nice to see him actually get some proper rest. Whether you know, like you said, he kind of picked up a knock and uh, immediately went back the tunnel. But nonetheless, you know, it's it's nothing, nothing major yeah. or anything. Yeah, Marino's so, saying he's going to be fit. He'll be fit. Exactly. So you know, it's just. Uh, and also, what is it? I think that that was our what we made our subs on in in a on a very structured basis. You know, our first was the our first sub was was <clears throat> the drug bond for Costa sub. Then ten minutes later, Ramirez on for Oscar. Then five minutes later, Sherlock for Fab. And it was just you know kind of. Those those subs really kept our game going. I think that was something really crucial. I'm happy the way that that Jose is doing this. I think he, and obviously no offense to his coaching style, I'm not trying to say I'm a better coach, but I think that the way he started off the season was rather tentative. You know, he was shutting matches down with Mikel in the last 15 and 10 minutes of games, and that kind of invited teams like City and United back into the games. Whereas now he's bringing on an extra attacker, bringing on uh, not necessarily someone who's going to to be scoring all the goals, but in, a forward-thinking player who, who, you know, obviously has the Mourinho mentality, where he gets on gets on the defensive side of the ball as well. So, especially those subs of Ramirez and Drogba were, were really noteworthy. I think they pressed the issue. Uh, that's going to keep other players fresh. Yeah, yeah, and I, and and the Sherla sub is is about as far from a defensive sub as you can exactly. get. So, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah, I, I I would agree with that. You know, it's nice to see that you know that Mourinho is not. Uh, He's not necessarily. I mean, granted, you know, this game, it's not like that Schalke was ever going to come back. Yeah. But uh, like you said, though, just even you know before this game, uh, you know, like you said, he he kind of shut things down early and it let you know City and United back into the game. But you know, I think that I think he learned that he can't he can't really do that. And granted, you know, our our squad was. I don't want to say that it was it was ran thin or anything because really it was just that Ramirez was hurt. But. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Ramirez is—he's just kind of—he's a different aspect. He would be—he—he's pretty much preferable over Obi Mikel to come off the bench. Definitely, so, definitely. yeah. So, uh, do you just do you have anything else nope. to uh, close up? That's all I want to say about that game. All right. Um, so yeah, looking ahead to uh, Saturday primetime game, twelve thirty on NBC Sports uh, against the uh, the team that. That broke Jose's uh, Jose's home win streak. Um, Those damn black cats! Oh my god, they just they never go away. Yeah. They're just they're so they're so pes- pesty. Pesty, just... pesty black cats. Hopefully we see some uh, some Josie. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, you know, I mean, I'm uh, just 
quick stat here. Uh, since our home loss to Sunderland, which was in April, uh, Chelsea are 17, six, uh, 17 wins, 6 draws, 1 loss in all competitions since that game. So, And the only loss, uh, like Amity mentioned last podcast, was to Atletico Madrid and the Champions League. So, Yeah, I love that. I love knowing it. I love when other teams know it. Exactly, yeah, that's the best part. That is the best part. Um, so last season, uh, like I said, in April, we lost to Sunderland at home. Uh, the away uh, the away game was, uh, well, I, we won, so it was it was more successful, but uh, not necessarily comfortable. Uh, a 4-3 shootout uh, yeah. in, uh, at, at Sunderland. So I don't want to have any of that this year. I'd, I'd really like to just show the same kind of metal that we've done that we've shown in the first 12 fixtures yeah i the everton game was really enough for me for for the whole uh for the whole season that was yeah yeah that was um it almost seemed like whoever scored last was going to be uh was going to be the one that won that game so but yeah I, I, i don't really think that i could i could handle another game like that but um yeah i mean i i think that with how rested our squad is um i don't really see I don't really see why we why we shouldn't get three points here. Um, like I've said, S- Sunderland are just they're, they're a pesky squad. Uh, Gus Poyet is just I don't know, just kind of pesky. But, uh, <laughs> I think that they'll have a good a good enough uh, backing, but they've yet they've yet to win their third match, and they've seen their fair share of goals as well. Um, a little just one more than Liverpool, but still that's not that's not saying much. And Chelsea are a team who, whether they go on the road or not, are going to score goals. It's just that, as we've mentioned countless times in the podcast, if we go on the road, I'd like us to keep a clean sheet. And we showed that we couldn't really do that at Liverpool, but that wasn't necessarily to be asked. We just wanted to get the points. But check back in our fixtures, you know, Man Man United, um, <clears throat> Liverpool. And I think our most recent one, without a clean sheet, was you'd have to go back to October. So... It's, uh, it's kind of a bit of an ask, but I know. But I think that we should really be looking for that as well, and not just to beat teams. We should be looking to beat teams handily, and also show them that we have a, a, a superior defense, which is something that we've been boasting since last season. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think that you know, I I don't really see the the Spurs game, uh, the turnaround on um, is it Wednesday? Yeah, on Wednesday. I don't really see that presenting. Too much of a problem. Um, no, it's, it's mean, Tuesday. I, I, no, that's the Spurs game's Wednesday. I mean, no, yeah, yeah, the Spurs game is on what the third, right? Yeah, yeah. December third. And then we have Wednesday. a Saturday match. Yeah, okay. yeah, and then okay, we have okay, yeah. we have the two days off after that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the you know there's enough days rested between there, and even you know now from now until Saturday, yeah, you know, exactly. there's we got three days rest until then. So. You know, I think fitness is is going to be fine. Um, I'd really, I'd, I'm really curious what happened with Remy and you know why he wasn't in the 18 today. But that's whatever. But you know, I'm I'm, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that we we I, I can't even remember the last time he played when it was. Yeah, honestly, I I, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be able to. No, I ain't going to be able to find it real quick. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know. I'd like to see him get a run out, just because you know it's 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 almost like we haven't got we haven't got to see him get a proper run out this season. I think he played the um, uh, the Shrewsbury game. I believe he played in, uh, started in, but yeah, I mean, other than that, yeah, Remy's just, fit. I just read I just read an article. He was fit, cleared fit as of Monday, and him, Charlotte, and Ramirez were all retu- were all pushing for starts as they've been recently returned to the squad. And he was included in one of the, in this article's provisional squad as well. So I'm surprised that we haven't heard anything about him. I mean, I guess everything is fine. He he was even quoted in an article saying that, you know, Chelsea have to remain uh, stalwart. We can't be complacent. Blah blah blah. So he must be uh-huh. just not in the in the starting team or in the, or in the team that traveled to Schalke. But I'm sure he'll feature soon. Like, yeah, yeah. And I mean, and, and, and the, the derby match. I'm sure we'll see him. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're finally getting into, uh, you know, pretty much from here until, um, pretty much from here until the end of 2014, we have two games a week, so. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, we're not we're not really going to have a choice. Exactly. He's got to play eventually. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that I don't see a reason why we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't go to Sunderland and not collect three points. Um, they're 14th on the table right now. They've only scored 12 goals this season. So, you know, I mean, there's only uh, four, four clubs that have scored less than them, Villa, Burnley, QPR, and Leicester. So, you know, they have a problem scoring goals. Maybe if they play a uh, fellow American out the door, maybe they'd fix that, but <laughs> probably not. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they have a little bit of a goal scoring problem. If we could just, just go there, get a shot out, and if we concede, can it please be from open play and not from a set piece? That would be, it'd just be nice if we just wouldn't concede. But, yeah, they'd um, have to concede at all, but, you know, I guess I'll take it from open. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, the, the turnaround to, uh, the Spurs game on Wednesday, just to look back to last season. Uh, our first match we played at White Hart Lane, and uh, it was 1-1 draw in September. And uh, we play Spurs at home on Wednesday, by the way. And uh, do you remember the score line of the game when we played them at home last season? Spurs? Huh? Spurs? Yes. I think it was, uh, was that the big one? Yeah, 4-0. Four 4-0? Four yeah. Yeah, so I would hope to get at least three goals uh, on Spurs, and I know that they have some attacking players, but I think that I think that we should beat them, and we should beat them handily. Frankly, I don't think there's should... yeah, there's there's really no again, there's really no reason, especially because it's at home. There's really no reason for us to not collect three points. I just oh my god, I don't like Spurs fans. I don't really know. <laughs> What it is? If you're a Spurs fan, I'm listening to this. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but I just I don't like Spurs fans. You don't, you don't have to like them. You know, you don't have to. That's not part of the deal. You're a ch- that's true. That is true. I mean, I I've just I don't know. I I've had it, I've had it out with you know Spurs fans on Twitter that are saying you know, with, uh, I forget. I I retweeted something one day about uh about I think it was the Palace game. And it was that banner about Abramovich's uh, dirty money or something like that. <laughs> yeah, everybody always, that's that's usually the number one insult. Like, oh, you got yeah, yeah, yeah. because of dirty Russian money. But yeah, I mean, the fact is, right now we're we're, we're winning everything, so you guys can shut up. Yeah, yeah. I just I couldn't imagine why someone would strive to be a Spurs fan. Hey man, really it's, it's all about location. If you get born there, if you get born into it, your family's into it, whatever, that's fine. Be, yeah, be a fan, that's... but don't complain about my team. Follow your team. <laughs> exactly. The fact that my team is top of the league and your team is tenth doesn't change the fact that <laughs> that's the quality of your team. So exactly, just, it is what it is. You know, no one made you a Spurs fan but yourself. Exactly. They just they they shouldn't have sold Gareth Bale, but that's you know that's yeah, they shouldn't let William take the trot over to Chelsea either. That's that's also true. That is also true. So yes, yeah, so, I mean I I think that's that's really all I have for this week. Um, you know I just oh my god now I I'm really excited for Wednesday's game. I'm already looking past the summer hey, game. Hey, I just want to in the moment. The hey, live in the moment. We got a ninety percent of that, and I really I really I Sunderland beat us last year. Sad that they sound they beat us. Yeah, yeah, and it's just. And that was the thing too. They just, and it's, it's weird looking at their record. They have seven draws this season. They've only lost three games. Yeah, they've lost less games in Liverpool. Half the games Liverpool have lost. <laughs> I love, that. I love how Liverpool is because I like making the, I like our, our, our benchmark. You know, <laughs> it's so mark, great. Yeah, they're now the gold standard. <laughs> and until they get rid of, until they get rid of Brandon Rodgers, the quote. I thought we were I thought we were fantastic. End quote. Brendan Rodgers. That's what he said about every single post post game presser, regardless of the fact that they lose and concede like three to four goals a match. But I thought we were excellent, or the lads played excellent, or they gave an amazing effort, admirable effort. Yeah, that's fine with me, Brendan Rodgers. You still fantastic, win. fantastic yeah. effort. Just unlucky. The fact is, they don't have Sturridge right now. That's really killing their chances because Liverpool requires that a striker goes insane and scores a ton of goals because they will ship goals all season long. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, I don't feel bad for them. They're uh, they're four points above relegation right now, so I hope they're having fun. No, oh, wow, that's crazy. They, uh, yeah. Because they, I mean, you know, they thought that yeah. it's crazy how uh, how far the mighty have fallen. <laughs> Jeez. 
just over the span of a couple months. Sure. Well, I mean, that's a, that's what happens. Rebuilding process is it's it's it happens every clip, and so they're they're having they're going through one right now when they're 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 learning that the painful throws of the Premier League will will not let you out. Teams are teams are very very good at capitalizing on. on on the littlest of mishaps, so this is something that they're going to have to ride out. But that's not our problem. Yep, yeah, I hope that they. Uh, I hope they never get out of the rebuilding phase. Exactly. I hope they stay in the rebuilding phase for decades to come. Right. So yeah, so I mean that's you know that's that's pretty much all I have today. Do you have uh, just anything else to cap off the pod? No, I'm good. All right, so yeah, if you uh, if you enjoyed, uh, be sure to rate and review on iTunes, Twitter, wherever uh, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, you can follow the Carefree Blues podcast at Carefree Blue Pod on Twitter. Uh, that's blue without the S, so it's Carefree Blues podcast is the title, but at Carefree Blue Pod on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at KB Jelly on Twitter and everything soccer on the Soccer Yanks website at www.soccerganks.com. And everything Carefree Blues at SoccerYanks.com slash Carefree Blues. I'm going to share with the great listeners of the pod where they can find you. You can find me on Twitter at Amadouit. That's A-M-A-D-O-I-T. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at 6, the number 6, Second Savage. If you want to check out some vines of games um, and analysis of key moments and stuff like that and or just funny stuff. Um, also, you can find my writing for Chelsea-specific things on ChelseaIndex.com. Um, definitely check us out. Tactics, analysis, um, reviews, previews, all that good stuff. Um, and also, check me out at WorldSoccerTalk.com, for which I'm doing Team of the Weeks, and I'm uh, managing their social media. So definitely check us out on all platforms. And if you want, guys, especially you know now that we've gotten deep into these podcasts, you should have some questions. You want to reach out to us on Twitter, reach out to us via uh <clears throat> the podcast itself, we can ask questions for the for, for the future podcasts, and definitely reach out to myself and Kyle because we're always available on Twitter, and we'd love to hear from you. Exactly, exactly. We both, uh, you know, we're both sort of uh, social media fiends, and you know, we both we we both spend way too much time on Twitter. So. Too much time, guys. Come seriously, just just drop us a line. We'll be there. Trust me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We we will respond in a timely manner. Promise. So, yeah, so, I mean, you know, that's that's a wrap. Uh, again, thank you for listening, and, uh, you know, be sure to rate, view on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter. Stay carefree wherever you may be. We are out. Mm-hmm.